SnapDeck IT is the expert go-to resource for all things CMMC, education, certification, preparation, and ongoing managed IT. Manage, secure, grow. Check it out at snaptechit.com. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of 123 CMMC. My name is Dana Mantilla, and our guest today is Carl Bickmore. Welcome back again, Carl. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good to see you again, Dana. Good to see you, too. All right. So today we're talking about contractor prep for CMMC. This is a good topic because I don't think we've really talked too much about the prep part before. All right. So our first question is, why is it essential to start now preparing for CMMC certification when final rulings on 2.0 are not yet complete? Oh, yeah. Well, so uh, look, I think a lot of folks um, felt like uh, when they went from the version 1.0 to the 2.0 version of CMMC, that that was cause or reason for delay. Um, for everything I see and understand and everything I, uh, that's being put out there, I don't expect there to be a very significant change in the overall time of when things need to be delivered by. And so um, I don't know that it's really reasonably a call for a reason for delay um, because the standards that they're going to measure against are well known. Uh, it's the NIST 800-171 standards and the 172 can be added as well if you're going for level, the new level three. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of folks have taken a little bit of pause there and I find that to be, well, they might regret that in the future. Um, because uh, the amount of time that it's going to take to actually become prepared, it's down to a, just a couple of years now to be ready. And uh, this is the kind of thing that would be very difficult for even a small organization to complete this process inside of a couple of years. And so um, even if you're just doing fundamental basic things to get you ready, um, you really probably should get it mapped out and start planning because it's not something you could just say, hey, I want this done and have it done in a year. Most of the time, I can't really see anybody that's been able to pull that off. It takes time to, to do this. Yeah, and I think that it's a, it was a good little excuse now that they can throw at some of the uh, people that were helping them with their little CMMC journey. Oh, you know what? We're going to take a pause. We're going to wait till all the rules are finally done, and then we're going to we're going to start doing something, which I agree with you is, is, is not, not the right approach to take. Okay, so what is the best way to find out the security health of your IT environment so that you can properly prepare for CMMC certification? Well, I've long time believed that the you know the fundamental process of any project of change you're looking to do, and this is true in, in IT or cybersecurity related things or in compliance projects, all these things kind of have a, a phase where you need to do information gathering, which you know I always refer to as get an assessment done so you actually know where you stand. And uh, that assessment would need to be fairly comprehensive uh, because of the number of controls involved and the things that you need to do. Uh, and uh, then after you have an assessment done, you look to apply best practices and then you create your action plan and then you manage that plan. And so in the ideal scenario, if you haven't already got a good comprehensive assessment that's done, that would be the best way to find out that, where you're at and where you stand and you can begin the process of preparation. And if you've already got the assessment done, then it's a matter of timing out your planning of how long you want to take till you get there mm -hmm. uh, to the level that you want to reach. Well, at least you still have a little roadmap there. Okay. So what is the process for preparing for CMMC certification and how long does it typically take? This is what people really need to understand is that how long does it typically take part? Yeah. Well, so there's, there's a couple major components of it, right? I mean, the beginning, there's some basic cyber hygiene things that need to be done. Those actually can be done, um, This and this is what I think often is thought of as level one. Those actually can be done at a relatively quick pace, uh, three to six months. You could probably get a lot of that done if your budget would allow that much you know, additional IT work to come in to get some of these things done. Um, but, but really, once you're stretching beyond level one, there's two major, well, three major components to it. One is that you need to uh, have policies that are written and documented uh, you need to affect the needed change and introduce systems and solutions that you don't currently have to meet certain controls. And then you need to have a regular ongoing audit and assessment practice going in order to validate and verify that you are, in fact, on a regular basis, continuing to meet those controls. And so there's really those major components all need to get into motion. And um, I find a lot of the folks we work with um, even if they've done some things uh, as far as like implemented a tool to do this cybersecurity thing or that cybersecurity thing, they've rarely done it comprehensively. 
And I find a lot of times that the policy piece is very much in need of help or really non-existent. Mm -hmm. And really, you just can't um, you can't begin this process without having a policy element. Anytime you're talking about cybersecurity or just IT in general, you should always start with a policy that just states what your company intends to do and what the standard is. Because if you keep working informally, like sit down, and have a meeting with the IT guys and say, I want this fixed. Well, they're going to fix it their way, but you won't have any assurance that you clearly handed off exactly what control you're trying to meet and how you're going about it. It really does have to start with a policy first, uh, then creating controls around that. And, you know, the good news is a lot of these controls are established. And so you just need to create the controls that meet the, the existing NIST 8171 controls and then the auditing and the, and the policy and the installation process. And so how long does it typically take, you know, for an organization with 20 to 50 people involved? This is probably a two to three year project um, unless you just happen to be, uh, I don't know, made of money in some money tree where you could just put hundreds of, you know, all sorts of hours in every month. It's, it's really quite a lengthy process to put these proce processes together, the policies, the procedures, the auditing, and to get all the solutions implemented that you're going to need to. It's more extensive than people realize, I think. You know what else, too, I was thinking about, too, with the, if, if the policies are not written down and let's say you have some turnover within your staff, you know, sometimes that happens. It's like, oh, the IT guy's been with us for a million years. And all of a sudden, you know, I don't know, he gets hit by a bus and then it's like, whoo, wait a minute, what's going on? Well, here? you know, this is so true. I mean, this is true of IT management in general and any business owner of any kind should be concerned about documentation, procedures and acting via policy. It's just especially true from a compliance standpoint, because the compliance examines the policies and validates that you operate and correctly follow through on your policies. And so it's uh, it's a good practice anyway. And your point's well taken. It does not. It, that's why you write it down. So there's no misunderstanding. And so that there's no question about how to check it and validate it, no matter who's doing it today, tomorrow, a year from now, two years from now. It's more volatile than ever. The IT field is no exception. There's certainly a lot of trade turnover and things happening. It's just, you really need to have things written down and easily understood by anybody. Yep, that's for sure. All right, so money from an investment standpoint, why is it important to plan your security roadmap for certification? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, look, I run a small business, right? And uh, there's all sorts of initiatives and things that I would love to get done and new tools I'd like to implement. Uh, but the reality of it is, is we're bound by time and money. And, you know, it's far more prudent to implement change 1% a day, for instance, as opposed to trying to do really big things to get a whole bunch done at once. It's better to be consistent, have a process that you follow. And so, you know, from an investment standpoint, it, it typically is too much of of a burden to do big swaths of the time. There's a lot of IT spend that needs to happen to implement systems and to implement policies that uh, simply is easier to handle if you spread it out over a few years as opposed to trying to compress it into a year or even less. And so, you know, from an investment standpoint, that's good. It also ensures that that you're prioritizing what what is being implemented uh, it accordingly. Um, based on both timing and risk, but also on the financial side of it. So from an investment standpoint, a security roadmap is about creating a plan that you can budget to. You can know what your spend is going to be over the next couple of years and how you're going to approach it. And, uh, you know, a good assessment will give you that budget of the things you need to do, and then you can move forward from there. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And like you said, you know, the budget part of it. And let's just say, for example, you get a contract and you have to have your certification done before you can, you know, get that contract. That's going to put a lot of pressure on your time frame if you're waiting to the last minute for things. Well, yeah. I, I mean, it, you know, sometimes you can get provisional access to a contract based on submitting uh, an assessment with a system security plan and a plan of action on milestones. And if that's the case, then your submission of that timeline now becomes an expectation that that follows through and, and, and keeps your organization's ability to operate under that contract. And so it's one of those things that uh, you, you want to really be careful and specific about it and have well thought out about it. It's not something you want to take lightly or just, you know, kind of push the paperwork along to try to get onto that contract and get that work where uh, without paying any attention to this, there is more enforcement than ever happening even today. And it, it's expected to only continue to grow. It, look, the problem that's trying to be solved here is one of the supply chain risks. And that problem is only getting worse every day. 
And so this is expected to become more intensive going forward. Unfortunately, all right, DOD contractors can get through a self-assessment on their own, but what about if the requirements like submitting like the supplier submit risk system, SPURS as we call it, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I guess supplier performance risk system is the SPRS, right? Uh, but the uh, um, look, here's the thing. The ability to self-assess is important. And I think if you've got the team uh, and the folks and available and the expertise on the controls and the CMMC standards and how to report, you can you can take yourself all the way there. You don't need a third party to do it. Um, I think a big, big mistake that a lot of folks make though is they think, oh, I'll just go to my existing IT team. They know about this stuff and they can assess it. Well, one, you, you might be asking the fox to watch the hen house, um, which is, um, you know, a bad practice because you may not get a true answer as to where you're at. Third party assessments are typically much higher recommended. Uh, and and then secondarily, um, there's, you know, your average IT team will not know these controls, the ins and outs and the details and how to execute on this. And so typically you need a third party for objectivity, but you also typically need a third party for um, for the uh, skill set, you know, and, and, uh, and so Look, if you can do it on your own, by all means, you can get your score. If you know how to do the Department of Defense scoring mechanism from the negative 210 to positive uh, 110 or something like that, uh, you know, you uh, you can go ahead and do it. Um, but I would caution you to be careful about it and to not submit knowingly false or improper or incomplete information. That's probably worse than not submitting a score. Uh, but the key thing is, it's like, can you do a self-assessment? Yes, you can. You can also hire uh, consultants to help you with your self-assessment. You don't have to do it with your own team, your own people to, in order for it to be considered a self-assessment. Yeah, and I think when you're submitting the SPURS score, you should probably have somebody there that specializes in that, if for nothing else, just to make sure you're doing it correctly, because you may be thinking, oh yeah, we do that. And you know, the person who's a professional in this, such as yourself, may say, oh, not exactly. <laughs> Well, so yeah, sometimes there are things we come across, like one time we were working with an organization and they were categorized incorrectly in the SPUR system, which meant that they were going to be held to a higher standard than they expected. And so we had to help them kind of sort through that process of getting their business categorized correctly and then only level one applied to them on the SPUR score. And so that really made a big difference on their, their change. And it's just working through some of that detailed process it really doesn't take long to get logged in and to submit your score. It's really about confidence in do you have that score and do you have the, the system security plans and the uh, action plans and gap analysis to uh, back up the scoring that you're submitting. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't, then, um, you know, you're, you're putting yourself maybe at a little bit extra risk. But, you know, most folks we're seeing out there, that's what their prime subcontractors are saying. They're saying, well, first start with an assessment and, and get a score together get that submitted, and then we'll take it from there. And I think the expectation is it's like, okay, we're going to put them on the map, and then we're going to ask for improvement over time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I know that they are all thinking about this 2024 timeframe because that's what's expected. Then they're going to have to meet it, and then their supply chain is going to have to meet it. So we're really down to a two-year process for a lot of these. Maybe three uh, is, is the real likely outcome here. And so because of that, you know, it's it's time, you know, it, and uh, um, doing a self-assessment has a lot of inherent risk that you just need to make sure you understand if you're going to take that route. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Know what you're doing. OK, in your mind, what is the value around DOD contractors working with a cybersecurity expert on CMMC certification versus assuming the risk themselves? We just kind of touched on this a little bit, but if you want to expand on this a little more. Yeah, I mean, look, here's the thing. It's like if so, if you've got a, a you know a statement of work and some scope and some labor put out for an assessment and a, a third party provider has you know made claims around expertise and may, maybe they're a registered provider organization, which they really should be if they're helping you with their, your assessment, um, the, um, the liability is a little bit different because uh, you know, you have a little more to stand on than just saying, hey, we kind of home grew this with our everyday IT folks uh, versus, hey, we hired somebody that you've accredited, you know, dear CMMC, and this is what they told us, you know. It's just a very different position. 
and uh, a lot more likely that you'll be able to spread the risk to that organization that they'll take on and do it correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would definitely say, if you, especially if you're going to challenge anything, that if you don't have a team of CMMC professionals behind you, oh, we did this ourselves. I don't well, and there are gray areas that are up for interpretation, in my opinion. And so, like, you know, being able to handle that or just know what you've seen in other organizations or how it's gone, there's just an experience level that really helps and, mm -hmm. and can really help you dodge, you know, finding yourself implementing something you didn't want to or don't need to just for a compliance reason. Right. All right. Do you find that most DOD contractors are prepared to prioritize security gaps and build a plan of action and milestones on their own? You know, I guess what is what is most right? You know, to me, if you look out there, you know, we're talking about a lot of folks in the um, the supply chain that are just small businesses that may have an IT person or two um, at most. Uh, you know, if if you're talking to a large like a prime subcontractor that has an army of IT people, an army of compliance people, they'll they'll probably be just fine. But the vast majority, I believe, are these small businesses that outsource their IT and they, they might need to outsource other parts, too, or they have a mixture of some insourcing and some outsourcing. And uh, in my experience, I, I, to be perfectly frank, I have yet to come across a single one that's really prepared for this. It's really, really figured it out and had somebody explain it to them in a way that applies to them directly. So mm -hmm. I, I find that generally they don't fully understand the gaps. They don't know how to time it out. They don't know which one's more important. They don't know how long things take. They don't know how, how much it costs. And so building out their plan of action and milestones uh, is, is a really tough exercise for them because they lack the practical experience uh, on how you should go about that. And they're probably an expertise in one area. But I mean, if they're in manufacturing, maybe their expertise oh, there, yeah. their expertise is in. Yeah, uh, this isn't about saying people are stupid or right. incapable. It's just they simply don't have the training, the expertise, and they really need to focus on doing what they do. Um, that's just the general reason to outsource. And it's the reason why I don't do my own accounting. Right. You know, I, I, I have a CPA firm that, that really helps us a lot with that because, um, I'm not an expert in that, you know, and, and I need somebody to help us make sure we do our taxes correctly. All, all that. It's the same kind of concept is, uh, you know, get, get experts doing what experts do. I do the same thing in my business for things we're not expert in. You know? mm -hmm. Good advice. All right, Carl. Well, that is it. Is there anything else you want to throw out there before we go? Uh, well, as always, we appreciate the time. Uh, you know, we have a lot of resources available on our website, uh, recordings like this and also others that we've put together and a lot of infographics from white papers, customer uh, stories that we've uh, put together on experiences and migration. So uh, check out snaptechit.com forward slash resources or just hit the website and you'll kind of see where to click and navigate. Uh, we're trying to put up a lot of helpful educational material there. And as always, feel free to, re to reach out. Uh, you can email, you can call, you can find the information at our website. Uh, you can grab me on LinkedIn. Any of that stuff's uh, uh, available. We're happy to engage, happy to help folks out through this journey. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for watching, everybody. And we'll see you on the next episode of 123 CMMC. Take care, Bye -bye. everybody. Yeah.